Hi, friends. How are we doing today? Well, I am thankful for your welcome. I'm thrilled to be a part of what God is doing in your community again today. I want to thank Pastor Kevin and the Potter's Wheel team for their generous welcome to me this weekend and last weekend and throughout the week. It's just been a delight to journey with you. This morning, I want to talk to you about the cycle of grace. Let me tell you a story. Last year, on a crisp fall evening, I gathered together with a group of pastors at a retreat center in California. There I met a man named Trevor Hudson. Trevor Hudson has been a pastor in South Africa for over 35 years. Now in his 70s, Trevor has experienced a lot of life in Jesus. He shared a jail cell with Desmond Tutu because of the, their civil rights protest against apartheid. And over the last 20 years, Trevor has been widely recognized around the world as an expert in spiritual formation, how people learn to become more and more like Jesus. On the first night of that retreat, Trevor used a dried up marker on a rickety old marker board to introduce me to the cycle of grace. Now, the cycle of grace was not Trevor's invention. It was developed by British psychologist Frank Lake. Lake first published the cycle of grace in the 1950s, seminal work, clinical theology. He was one of the pioneers who brought together the worlds of psychology and theology. Now, here's how the cycle of grace came about. In his clinical work, Dr. Lake worked with many missionaries who experienced intense burnout and he observed a pattern. He watched as countless young clergy would eagerly and enthusiastic embark on their assignment to the mission field. They left with faith-filled fervor and zeal and a sense of purpose. But after a period of time, the same leaders became resentful, cynical about God and life and themselves. And as I think about those missionaries, I've got to ask, are any of you limping into this season with a sense of melancholy or sadness, fatigue, or just good old-fashioned discouragement? Now, it's really common, even for people who know God and love God and work for God, to become jaded and disillusioned serving God. We see burnout throughout the Bible. We find Moses in Ex Exodus 18 at wit's end, buried under the burden of responsibility. We observe David in the cave in 1 Samuel 18, running for his life from King Saul and deeply disappointed with God's apparent lack of provision. We see Martha in the kitchen in Luke chapter 10, fretting over her well-meaning attempts to serve Jesus. We find Elijah in the wilderness, ready to keel over and die, in part because God did a miracle through him, but not for him. The most vivid example of biblical burnout may be the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah got so low, he cursed the day he was born and cursed the man who announced his birth. It's a biblical illustration of rock bottom. Well, Frank Lake was deeply troubled by seeing so many missionaries staggering back from the field with bitter cynicism that he wanted to do something about it. Lake connected with a Swiss theologian named Emil Bruner, who shared his concern for these ministry leaders. The two of them carved out time for a retreat in which they immersed themselves in the gospel life of Jesus. They simply read and reread over and over the first four books of the New Testament. They hoped to discern a pattern that might reveal why Jesus didn't get burned out under enormous strain and stress. Now, I want to pause right here to point out the brilliance of their research. These scholars, who were also disciples of Jesus, stumbled upon a key principle of life, of a life that thrives. It's this. If you want to live like Jesus lived, you have to do what Jesus did. 
As Lake and Bruner studied the life of Jesus in the Gospels, they observed He lived in a distinctive way, which they called the cycle of grace. When I first heard Trevor explain the cycle of grace, he drew it on that dilapidated marker board. I'm going to do my best to illustrate it for you today with a few slides. The first observation Lake and Bruner made was that Jesus lived His life in a balance between input and output. Said simply, Jesus was able to give because He received. And input comes before output. You'll notice on the diagram, there are two places in which grace flowed into the life of Jesus. The first one is acceptance. Jesus knows who He is and where He stands in relationship to God the Father. As Lake and Bruner studied the Gospels, they observed that Jesus only begins His ministry after He receives His acceptance and identity from the Father. Think about the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. Before He begins His public ministry, Jesus is dunked into the water by the baptizer. And he, as He comes up out of the water, the heavens split open. The Spirit of God descends upon Him like a dove. And we hear the voice of the Father saying in Mark chapter 1, verse 11, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. After pondering this passage and where it falls in the life of Jesus, Lake warned of the dangers of doing anything for God, before having a strong sense of your identity in God. Friends, if you truly believe that God loves you before you've done anything, then your doing will never be about earning. Interestingly, something similar happens later in the life of Jesus as He sets His sights on Jerusalem, where He will be crucified for the sins of the world. Jesus is reminded of His identity at the transfiguration in Matthew 17 and Luke 9 and Mark 9, where the Father says to Peter, James, and John, as they see the radiant glory of Jesus, this is my Son whom I love. Listen to Him. Question. What if, before you began to do anything for God, you knew how much you were loved by God? Acceptance describes the experience of a relationship in which someone is fully known and cherished and loved. You feel safe in that relationship. You don't have to prove yourself to that person. You believe deep down in your bones that your output does not equal your value. See, Lake and Bruner were convinced Jesus worked from a deep and abiding sense of acceptance he did not need to prove Himself to anyone because the Father proved His love to Him. And I'm telling you, if you want to live like Jesus lived, you have to do what Jesus did. And that might start with trusting God's love for you, like Jesus did. Friends, even a cursory glance at the Bible will confirm it before you've done anything to deserve it and after you've done plenty to lose it. You are an irreplaceable individual with immeasurable value to God. And my friend, that is true of you whether you believe it's true or not. Think about this for a moment. According to the clear teaching of the Bible, there is nothing you can do to change God's love for you. And that's true in spite of your sin, in spite of your shame, in spite of your mistakes. You are an irreplaceable individual with immeasurable value to God. Now, there's a second way in which grace flowed into the life of Jesus, and Lakenbrunner called this part sustenance. While acceptance is merely a work of grace that we receive, sustenance involves a dynamic partnership between God and an individual. Friends, here we're talking about spiritual practices. We do things that bring us closer to God, and God works in us through those practices to shape us and mold us and strengthen us. Oh, if I had a time machine, I'd take you back 40 years so you could come to Sunday school with me and observe 
me learning one of those sustaining practices. See, my family attended a tiny little church. We, we didn't have a cafe. Our music wasn't particularly good. But at that church, there were a handful of volunteers who took their time and their talents that God gave them to teach me that I could trust Jesus. Perhaps the most powerful tool I received to guide my young journey of faith was the spiritual practice of memorizing passages of the Bible. Now, I've memorized a lot of verses along the way, but I especially remember the first one. See, the first verse I remember committing to memory, besides John 3, 16, and Jesus wept. <laughs> the first verse I remember committing to memory has shaped my life to this day. It's found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. The Apostle Paul writes, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Paul says, whatever you do, whether that's plowing fields or teaching school or curing cancer, whatever you do. Here, Paul's talking to parents who are trying to raise their kids without killing their kids. Paul's talking to students learning history and memorizing the multiplication tables. Paul says, whatever you do, do it with everything in you. Put everything you've got into it because doing so can be an act of worship. Now, when I first committed this verse to memory, and from that day forward, this verse has informed every aspect of my life. I applied this to, to chemistry and calculus. I applied it to drum lessons. I apply this every week in my work at my church. As I pour myself into my tasks of the week, whether praying or preaching or plunging a toilet, I believe those everyday responsibilities can be beautiful expressions of worship. And I'm telling you, verses like this make me want to work harder. Verses like this make me want to work faster. Amen. But I wonder if verses like this can be taken too far. Is there such a thing as working too hard? Biting off more than you can chew? Stressing, striving to prove yourself and earn your worth? I'm curious, do we have any perfectionists in the room this morning? This will be a moment of confession. It's okay, raise your hand, it's okay. Hey, God loves you. God loves you. We don't. We see your failures and think you should work harder, but God loves you. Seriously, friends, I think we can take this too far. Here's another great verse. I love this verse, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. My dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Yes. Throw yourself into the work that God is doing in and around the world. Give it your best energy, your greatest focus. Yes. But what about rest? What about restoration? What about taking time for your soul? Look, do you push yourself too far? Do you expect too much from yourself? How often do you give yourself permission to slow down, to reflect, to tend to the health of your heart? Now, this may be hard for you, especially if what you're doing is important. Many parents expect too much from themselves. They expect to be perfect parents with perfect kids and perfect pets who play the piano perfectly. <laughs> parents easily slide into perfectionism. I've seen this with teachers and leaders and counselors and doctors. I've seen this with pastors because the stakes are high. See, in ministry, one more meeting doesn't mean more money. In ministry, one more meeting could mean a marriage preserved or a soul saved. One more meeting might be the breath of life for someone who's longing for hope and healing. Yeah, I'm probably overstating the significance, but it feels like reality in the moment. In ministry, 
It's easy to, to believe that success means keep serving, keep giving, keep going until you've got nothing left to give. It's easy to believe, but I don't buy it. Some years ago, we came up with a little axiom. It, it's a saying we use a lot around the church office. I find myself saying it to a colleague about once a week. You can't save the world. Now, friends, that's our compact way of reminding each other we aren't God. We cannot solve every problem. We cannot meet every need. Oh, there are a lot of things you could do with your time, but you have so little time. Do you ever complain? There aren't enough hours in the day to do, to do, to do the important things you're supposed to do. Well, here I recall the wisdom of Dallas Willard who maintained, God never gives anyone too much to do. We do that to ourselves or allow others to do it to us. Now your desire to do all the things for all the people may be a good thing. It can come from a desire to love your neighbor as yourself. It can come from a place of passion and compassion where you long to right the wrongs of the world. You, you long to, to see wholeness and healing. You, you, you want to save the world for all the right reasons. But there may be some not so right reasons too. Sometimes I just want to be the hero. Sometimes I want to be seen as the savior. You know, often our attempts at saving the world have toxic side effects. You support a friend while avoiding the problems in your own marriage. You, you, you turn the business around while letting your kids down. You help everybody do everything to the neglect of what God wants to do in you. Now, think back to the cycle of grace with me. As Lake and Bruner pondered burnout missionaries, they, they contrasted the practices of the missionaries with the practices of Jesus. And then they considered all the soul-filling activities that Jesus engaged in throughout the Gospels. And they observed Jesus actually built his life on a number of life-giving practices that sustained him. Well, when I returned from that pastor's retreat, I pitched this cycle of grace to our church staff. And we brainstormed a list of the life-giving things we see Jesus doing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, some of them were obvious, like prayer, solitude, reflecting on the Bible, worship at the synagogue. But as we thought about it, we identified a few not-so-obvious examples as well, such as spiritual friendship, long walks, eating, celebrating nature, partying, boating, Sleeping. You know, sometimes the best way to tend to your soul is to take care of your body. Here's another practical tip from our friend Dallas. He said, one thing that will help you spiritually is arranging a nice nap. He says, remember, resting is a primary test of our faith. We rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. So, if you're weary, and if you can, take a nap. Rest. Then thank God and return to your day's activities. Now, there may be some barriers preventing you from carving out time for these soul-sustaining practices like that. Maybe it's a lack of faith. Is it really worth my time? Is it really worth my effort? Another barrier may be people-pleasing. <laughs> Your time is dictated to you by the will and the wishes of others. I gotta ask, do we need better boundaries? Do we need to get better at saying no to people so we can say yes to God? Now, saying no may mean disappointing a friend from time to time. Say no may mean you can't live up to your mother's expectations or your colleagues' expectations, even your kids' expectations. 
that to do this effectively, my friends, you're going to have to courageously cr- confront your fear of spostas. Do you know what a sposta is? Now, spostas all look a little different, but they almost always reek of guilt and shame. Let me explain. You're supposed to show up early. You're supposed to stay late. You're supposed to bake the cake with flour you ground by hand from the grain of artisan growers. You're supposed to. You caught on, didn't you? When we live to please people, we exhaust ourselves because there are so many people to please. Parents, grandparents, employers, employees, colleagues, neighbors, board members. But let's look, a good, let's look again to Dallas Willard who says this, we can't live in the kingdom of God and make human approval a significant aim. He says we must lovingly allow people to think what they will. Again and again, through the Gospels, we see the Son of God pull away to be with God. Even when there were more people to be healed, more needs to be met. And Luke 15, Luke paints the picture. He says the news about Jesus spread all the more. So the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Luke tells us the people keep coming. They want to hear him and they want to be healed by him. However, Luke interjects, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Friends, I think there's something for us to learn here. Do you need to put more focus on your connection to God? Doing so does not mean you're selfish. Doing so means you're wise because wisdom reminds us you're no good to the rest of us if your soul is withering away from within. To illustrate, let me remind you of the last flight you took. Once aboard the plane, you were greeted by a friendly flight attendant who offers you and fellow passengers a safety demonstration. Now, some of you may fly often enough you tune them out while they're talking, but if you do, I bet you know the spiel. The flight attendants instruct us to make sure our seat belts are securely fastened. To fasten the belt, insert the metal tip into the buckle and adjust the strap so it fits low and tight across the waist. The flight attendants point out that all exit signs are clearly marked with an exit sign. And they encourage us to take a moment to find the nearest exit, which may in fact be located behind us. And if the cabin loses pressure, panels will open to reveal oxygen masks. Our flight attendants instruct us to fully extend the mask, place it over your nose and mouth, adjust the mask as needed, then breathe easily. (laughs) Now, what am I missing? Be sure to adjust your own mask before assisting others. Oh, friends, that means I need to be sure to adjust my mask before I adjust my wife's masks or my daughter's masks or my team member's masks. Why? Because I will do them no good in an emergency if I'm conked out in the aisle. Luke tells us Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Maybe you long for the strength of Jesus in a weary season. If that is you, my friend, just remember, if you want to live like Jesus lived, you have to do what Jesus did. That leads us to the third stage in the cycle of grace. And note that here, we transition from the input phase of the cycle to the output phase of the cycle. Lake and Brunner called this part sustenance. The scholars observed Jesus was well aware of his significance in the world. 
we could see it in what, he sometime, what we sometimes call the I am statements of Jesus, especially in John's gospel. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the true vine. But interestingly, the Bible offers similar identity statements for you and for me. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. It says you are holy. That means you're set apart for a special task. The Bible says you're blessed to be a blessing. Now, now here's what I want to say to you specifically, whether you feel good enough or smart enough or talented enough or not. The Bible tells us you are chosen. That means you've been picked for a purpose. Even if you feel far from God, my friend, he loves you more than you know, and he's picked you for a purpose too. Your life's meant to matter. And, and I'm telling you, he, he longs for you to experience his love so you could share his love to the people around you. See, you and I are called to be God bearers to the world. We're, we're born to be active partners in God's mission of love and peace and joy and justice, bringing heaven on earth, bringing up there down here. And I'm telling you, you, you have a unique way of being in the world. You are a distinctive amalgamation of your gifts and talents and personality and experiences. Even your suffering, do you realize your personal experience of suffering is something significant that God can use to heal others? I believe we all have a deep need for significance. We have a God-given longing for meaning. We want our life to signify something. So whatever you do, don't suppress your drive for significance. Now, you may need to suppress your ego, but that's different. Dallas maintained, unlike egotism, the drive to significance is a simple extension of the creative impulse of God that gave us being. It is not filtered through self-consciousness any more than as our lunge to catch a package falling from someone's hand. It is outwardly directed to the good to be done. Dallas said, we were built to count as water is made to run downhill. We are placed in a specific context to count in ways no one else does. That is our destiny. My friend, that is your destiny. And friends, this is personal. Herbert Alfonso is convinced each of us has an unrepeatable uniqueness. See, there is only one you in time and space. What does God want you to do? Who does God want you to be? Uh, well, I can promise you it's not being a loser. He's not called you to be a failure. Oh, he may allow you to fail, sure. But he's called you to significance and he's equipping you for it every step of the way. But, 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 if you wanna see your significance, if you wanna discern your purpose, I recommend you follow the pattern modeled by King Jesus because if you wanna live like he lived, you gotta do what he did. Now the final phase of the cycle of grace is what Trevor calls fruitfulness. Lake and Bruner labeled it achievement Trevor prefers fruitfulness. Both words help us understand the meaning. Now, the, the, the fruit of Jesus' labor was obvious. Through his teaching, healing, serving, and loving, the hopeless found hope. The poor found provision. The outsider became the insider. Oh, all along the way, Jesus helped people rethink their thinking about God and let's not forget, Jesus was the Lamb of God who became the sacrifice for the sins of the world. But then he rose again, after which he called and equipped a team of people who would change the world. And somehow, you and I are on that team today. And here's the truth. God has called you to participate in his work in the world too. Now, your role in his work may look different 
in different seasons, but he's inviting you to join him in his work of bringing heaven on earth in every season of life. But friends, if we're going to talk about fruitfulness, we've got to talk about fruitlessness. I think we need to talk about failure. Look, there are a lot of ways you can burn out, but the fastest may be failure. When you exhaust yourself only to achieve lackluster results. We're, we're, we're talking about living with unfulfilled expectations that others have of you, that you have of you, that the discouragement and disillusionment that accompanies burnout often comes when our dreams get dashed on the stone-cold surface of reality, and we disappoint people. Now, friends, I would argue that's why the missionaries in Lakenbrunner's study hit rock bottom. Remember, after considering the life of Jesus in the Gospels and contrasting it with the lives of the missionaries, Lake and Bruner concluded that people in ministry were not living in the cycle of grace. They were working through the cycle backwards, counterclockwise against the flow of grace. Let me explain. They worked tirelessly to achieve fruitful outcomes so they would feel significant. And they hoped that that feeling of significance would sustain them and strengthen them and fill them up so that they could keep giving and going and stressing and striving to earn the acceptance of the people around them. You see, those missionaries, for them, it wasn't the cycle of grace. It was the cycle of works. My friends, my question to you is this. Which direction are you circling today? What is the dominant way you're living your life? Are you living in the flow of God's grace? Or are you circling the drain as you spiral down the cycle of works? My friend, if you're presently experiencing a stubborn fatigue that's, that's sapped, that, that seeped deep into your soul, poisoning your thoughts and your feelings with despondency and despair, I want you to consider the possibility that you may be going the wrong way around the cycle of grace. If failure saps you of energy, you may be going the wrong way around the cycle of grace. If letting people down causes you to break down into a heap of shame, you may be going the wrong way around the cycle of grace. I'm working on my PhD in leadership from Fuller Theological Seminary. I'm studying how leaders create environments in which feedback is easier to, to give and receive. And one of the things that I'm finding is leaders who fear failure, leaders who see failure as a condemning evaluation of their significance and their acceptance, those leaders don't respond well when they hear unfavorable truth about themselves. When they get feedback, they get defensive. They deflect, they blame, they rationalize the feedback. They, they, they minimize its significance. Oh, my friends, if you're failing, to receive feedback with dignity and empathy from a colleague or an employee or a friend or a spouse, you may be going the wrong way around the cycle of grace. Friends, why do we have to let failure push our buttons, rob us of joy? I think Lake and Bruner answered the question for us. The reason we allow failure to get to us is we're living our lives circling the wrong way around the cycle of grace. Henry Cloud suggests we've, we need to learn to normalize failure in our everyday life. When Henry says we should normalize failure, he doesn't mean we should settle for mediocrity, not at all. He just means we should see failure as an opportunity to grow and learn and get better rather than a condemnation of our significance and acceptance. How often do you find yourself frozen in fear, delaying a decision, maybe never making a decision because you're afraid to fail? Maybe you need to give yourself permission to fail. 
If you don't give yourself permission to fail, you will never give yourself an opportunity to succeed. Friends, we got to learn to normalize failure in our everyday lives and trust God with the outcomes. Look, I've learned a lot of things from that man, Dallas Willard. Truly, I have a Dallas Willard quote for everything. You can ask my daughters, you can ask my church staff. But get this, out of all the things I learned from Dallas Willard, this quote has shaped me more than any other. Dallas said, don't trust your best. Do your best and trust God. See, this is about entrusting outcomes to God. Your job is to do your best. But whatever you do, don't trust it. If you have a habit of trusting your best, you're probably moving the wrong way around the cycle of grace. I could summarize all I've said here with this from John Ortberg. He says outcomes are a great source of feedback, but a terrible source of fuel. Think about that for a second. What's he arguing? Ortberg's arguing that if we see outcomes as the fuel that keeps us moving and grooving and giving and going, then we're moving the wrong way around the cycle of grace. Now friends, here's a key point I don't want you to miss. In the cycle of works, the ultimate goal is acceptance. The ultimate ambition is to be loved. That's what people running around the cycle of works are chasing after. Oh, but remember, with God, you begin there before you even lift a finger. My friend, you are an irreplaceable individual with a measurable value to God. My invitation for you today is if you find yourself joyless and jaded, discern if you're revolving the wrong way around the cycle of grace. And then reverse course by making different choices to live within the cycle of grace. Make a choice to learn from Jesus. Because if you want to live like Jesus lived, you have to do what Jesus did. Now here is his invitation to you in his own words. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Friends, this is the quintessential call of the disciple of Jesus. He says to us, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. First, Jesus offers this invitation, but it's on you to respond. He welcomes you with open arms. Will you walk toward him? Will you walk with him? And look who he invites. All who are weary and burdened. That word weary in Matthew's original Greek language means working to the point of exhaustion. Are any of you tired today? <laughs> you work, you run, you give, you go. But in the end, you feel like you're just spinning your wheels. Oh, if that's you. You're, Jesus says to you, you're just the person I'm looking for. Come, and you'll find rest. He says, come to me all who are burdened. Sometimes it's translated heavy laden. It means to, to be weighed down by a heavy load. Metaphorically speaking, burdens are the shoulds or the spostas of the world. Expectations, pressure, stress imposed by another. What are some of the shoulds you've been bearing lately? John Ortberg offers this insight. He says, Jesus was very comfortable disappointing people as long as he knew he was pleasing the Father. 
My friend, if you are a chronic people pleaser, let me tell you about my rabbi who says, come to me and I will give you rest. Maybe you've been burdened by religion. Life is hard enough as it is, but legalistic religion can be an indescribable weight. And legalistic religion can turn rest into weariness. Maybe you're wearied by a religion that doesn't work but requires you to work. That's when religion becomes merely a list of do's and don'ts. When religion asks much but gives little and holds you to such a high standard that it seems impossible to reach. And then you live life with a nagging sense of guilt everywhere you go, and that guilt convinces you that you will never, ever be good enough. Oh, your soul may be steeping in a sour solution of religious legalism right now, and the shame has begun to saturate your entire life. Dear friend, if that's you, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Maybe you want to please God, but you can't. You know you should forgive your father, but your heart is stone cold toward him. You want to watch your mouth, but your tongue is so sharp. You want to be a patient mom or a patient manager, but you can't seem to do it. And you've exhausted your soul trying. If that is you, I'll tell you about my rabbi. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. You know, there's another word that leaps off the page to me. It's that word, all. All who are weary and burdened. All is a marker of his grace. It's an utterly inclusive word. But you ask, what if I've been used and abused? Or what if I've sinned? What if I'm a hypocrite? What if I'm a stubborn, insolent child who, who can't take God at his word, though he's proven himself faithful again and again? <laughs> Jesus says, all. Oh, I think that includes you. Then he invites us, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You know this image. A yoke is a wooden frame that's stretched across the backs of a couple animals. It enables them to pull heavy loads and plow a field. Question, why would Jesus use this language about his teaching? I mean, look, if his, if his end game, his outcome is rest, why would he offer a yoke? Well, in the ancient world, rabbis had their own interpretations of the Torah or the law of God. There were different schools of rabbis, just like there were different pastors with different interpretations. Well, these different schools of rabbis embraced different interpretations or applications of the law as they applied their teaching to everyday life to the people they, they were leading. For example, Consider the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, one rabbi may interpret that to mean you should feed your neighbor's animals while he's on vacation. Love your neighbor as yourself. Another rabbi may come along and say, yes, you should feed your neighbor's animals, but you also need to do his laundry. Love your neighbor as yourself. A third rabbi may argue, no, it is not necessary to feed his animals, but you should do his laundry and pay his taxes. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, by the time of the first century, a rabbi's interpretation of the Torah or the law of God became known as his yoke. If you or I were to become a disciple of Jesus, we would then take on that yoke of that rabbi or his particular understanding of the teaching of God. So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, he's saying, Trust me for my interpretation of God's law. New Testament scholar Dale Bruner commented, a yoke is a work instrument. Thus, when Jesus offers a yoke, he offers what we might think tired workers need least. They need a mattress or a vacation, not a yoke. But Jesus realizes that the most restful gift he can give the tired is a new way to carry life, a fresh way to bear 
responsibility. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus says, if you adopt my way of living, you will find rest for your soul, not just a good night's sleep or even a vacation on the beach. Jesus says, if you follow my teachings, you will find rest at the very core of your being. Doesn't that sound powerful? Doesn't that sound wonderful? Look, it's at least worth looking into, am I right? He explains, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now friends, this doesn't mean that Jesus lowered the standards. No, actually, actually in some way Jesus raises the bar. The law said don't commit adultery. Jesus says don't lust. T to be clear, Jesus doesn't make his yoke easier by relaxing the standards of righteousness. No, Jesus offers relationship with him through which we find the power to live righteously. See, he bears the yoke with us. And let's make no mistake about who's doing the heavy lifting in the relationship. Look, if you're anything like me, not a day goes by and that you don't realize you'll never hit the mark on your own. You'll never make it over the bar. Maybe you're weary and burdened because of your failure. Your failure as a father, a mother, a friend, a spouse. Huh. How about trying a different yoke? How about spending less time trying to change and more time asking Jesus to change you? My friend, if you could only grasp the lavish love of God who wants you to change, forgives your failure to change, then helps you to change. Oh, I'm telling you, let Jesus form you, not just inform you. But to do so, you've got to come to him. You've got to take up his yoke. You've got to learn from him. Because if you want to live like Jesus lived, you have to do what Jesus did. Please stand with me. My friends, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this message today by responding to God in worship. I've asked the worship team to share a song with you today that I have been playing on repeat over the last few months. It will be new to many of you. I've listened to it over and over and over again as a way to make sure I'm circling the right way around the cycle of grace. And I hope you find it helpful as well. Friends, maybe, maybe you're feeling anxious or overwhelmed. Maybe today you're, you're, you're tired or banged up or burnt out. If so, may you stop striving for a better life. And instead, may you think like Jesus thought and do what Jesus did so you can live like Jesus lived by God's grace. Jesus has invited you to come to him. And, and maybe God's inviting you today to offer him an embodied response. Hmm? Maybe he's inviting you to respond to him by raising your hand. Maybe he's inviting you to physically come to the front of this worship, this worship space and accept his personal invitation to you. Dear friends, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Open your heart to our Lord now.